Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. There has been a lot of tension between the Indigenous community and a Winnipeg hotel following a viral video showing hotel staff restraining a First Nations woman. The video in the history of the hotel has some raising concerns about the safety of Indigenous people in Winnipeg. Tamara Pimentel has more. This video taken Christmas Day resurfaced online this week. An Indigenous woman restrained by staff at the Marlboro Hotel. It raised questions of the treatment of Indigenous people in Winnipeg. In 2014, 26-year-old Colton Pratt was last seen at the Marlboro. He's been missing ever since. And for his mom, Lydia Daniels, the video brought back a wave of emotions. And it triggered me and brought me back to that first few days where he went missing. So it's been pretty tough. And the last thing I said to him, I said, I am worried about you. Be careful. And then he said, I know, Mom. Hotel staff and Winnipeg police say the woman in the video was restrained for brandishing a knife. Using zip ties was justified, according to police. The woman has been charged with assault with a weapon. She also faces the same charge from an incident that happened in September 2023. The video and history of the Marlboro sparked a lot of anger and tension between the hotel and the Indigenous community. In 2013, two Winnipeg men faced prostitution charges after police broke up an alleged brothel operating out of two hotels, one of which was the Marlboro. But the current staff say they are getting threats. The hotel is temporarily closed. In a statement, the general manager told APTN this is extremely unsettling to our staff and management who fear for their safety. For now, the doors are closed and Winnipeg police are investigating. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. As week two of the inquest into the mass stabbings on James Smith Cree Nation and nearby Weldon comes to an end, we're hearing more about causes of death from Saskatchewan's chief forensic pathologist. And community members are also now speaking out. Here's our VJ, Rachel May, in Melfort. Today was filled with information that was hard to hear. Chief Forensic Pathologist Sean Laddam testified today. Laddam provided insight into the deaths of Robert Sanderson, Carol Burns, Earl Burns, Thomas Burns, and Wesley Patterson. Laddam explained times of death, toxicology reports, and injuries sustained. We also heard from Diane Rain of Correctional Services Canada. She was Miles Sanderson's parole officer for around two months. She described him as an average offender, an active and helpful participant in prison programs. Miles Sanderson killed Brian Buggy Burns' wife Bonnie and son Gregory, whom we'd heard about yesterday. His reaction is typical of community members observing the inquest. I would like to see more programming, revise the programming, like revise all the programs and add more programming to it. Chelsea Stone Stand is a band member. She has standing at the inquest, meaning she's allowed to cross-examine witnesses. She says there needs to be better communication between all agencies. It often circles back to what they can extract from the community and not what they can put back into our communities. The inquest will continue Monday and Tuesday with more from elders and the National Parole Board of Canada. Rachel May, ABTN National News, Melford, Saskatchewan. Thanks, Rachel. Researchers in Ottawa will soon start testing wastewater from Nunavut in the hopes of reducing the territory's high tuberculosis rates. It's called the Taima TB Wastewater Study and will focus on the city of Iqaluit over the next five years. Inuit living in northern Canada experience TB rates as much as 300 times higher than the non-Indigenous population. Rob Delatola is with the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Ottawa and also part of the research study. He says with rapidly improving technology and wastewater testing, researchers believe they will be able to expand beyond TB to prevent other diseases in remote communities. 
So I think this is an application of wastewater-based surveillance for maybe health inequities, where you kind of see a community that has, um, in this case, that are experiencing hundreds-fold higher rates of TB than, than um, non-Indigenous Canadians. Um, and we're, but you can also look at this for pandemic preparedness. We, we know we're, we're, we went through or going through the COVID-19 pandemic, and you know we now understand that there's going to be another one. And so the idea of tracking or finding that next disease X. Nunavut's lone member of parliament, Lori Idlut, hopes the devolution agreement signed just last week will help bring more transparency for Inuit. Our Trevor Wright has more. Nunavut NDP MP Lori Idlout hopes that decision making on lands and resources will be more transparent under Nunavut's new devolution agreement. Um, I, I definitely hope that uh, with the government of Nunavut taking over decision making for lands and resources, that uh, an aspect of that gives more information sharing to Inuit. Edloud says that before the deal was struck, she was working on stronger legislation that would require resource companies and governments to consult in more meaningful ways with the territory. Um, I find that the duty to consult as a st legal standard uh, comes in too late, and I think that uh, with uh, UNRIP and the importance of free prior and informed consent, that's what I was aiming to do with my bill, and I really hope that uh, with the devolution agreement that there's going to be serious considerations about how to keep Inuit informed when it comes to lands and resources uh, and what to do with the marine environment as well. Idloud is excited about the devolution agreement's human resources framework. Uh, what I did notice uh, that is unique with this devolution agreement is the investments that will be made for training uh, and the potential for that training to turn into employment. I'm very excited about the, those kinds of investments because Inuit do want to contribute, Inuit do want to get uh, to, uh, to learn. Uh, to be able to adjust to uh, whatever, whatever environment is around us. Now that the agreement is signed, Edloud is looking to see more Inuit working in government and taking part in education and training programs. Trevor Wright, APTN National News, Hikaluit. Well, while you don't hear about it much these days, Yukon was the first territory to lead the charge in signing its devolution agreement two decades ago. Our reporter Sarah Connors tells us why that is. It's been one week since the historic signing of Nunavut's final devolution agreement. Devolution is defined as the transfer of power from a large central government to smaller, more localized regions of power. It's something former Council of Yukon First Nations Grand Chief Ed Schultz is passionate about. He advocated for the territory to be the first to sign its own devolution agreement in 2003. Quite frankly, it was the First Nations who caused devolution. He says devolution couldn't have happened without the umbrella final agreements a decade prior. In 1993, Canada, Yukon government and the Council signed the agreements. This set the ball rolling for 11 of the territory's 14 First Nations to settle their individual final agreements and become self-governing under Canada's constitution. The treaties came first, that was the prerequisite, right? You had to have the treaties. The treaties gave the leverage. This is one of the most phenomenal political transitions in Canadian history. Indigenous governance professor Ken Coates says devolution in the territory has been largely successful. He says Nunavut should take notice, especially as devolution hasn't altered the importance of Indigenous governments in the Yukon. So the Indigenous governments had a lot of authority dealing with Ottawa. Now they have a lot of authority dealing with the, with the local territorial government. Yukon has learned that very, very well. And I think it's one of the most important and most impressive elements in the transition. Schultz says devolution has helped put the power of the territory in the hands of its own people. Then you have this package of local communities, local people having more say and ability over their own backyard, who plays there, who doesn't, and if you do, here's the rules. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, CarMax. 
We'd like to hear what you think about devolution or anything else you might want to reach out about. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, you can send us an email to news at aptn.ca. And to read and watch our stories, you can go to our website, that's aptnnews.ca. You can also find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Many northern communities are reliant on ice roads. Coming up after the break, we'll tell you about one community feeling the effects of this year's warm weather. Welcome back. Much of the NWT and other northern communities are reliant on seasonal ice roads and ice crossings. 13 of 33 communities are accessible by boat and air only. However, as winter approaches, nine of those communities become accessible by winter roads. The Dempster Highway, which connects the Arctic Beaufort Delta to Yukon, has two ice crossings. The start of the winter has been unseasonably warm though and the Yellowknife to Deda Ice Road is still not open. The remote western Arctic community of Aklavik has been feeling those effects. Carly Schogner has this story. Ice road season is my favorite time of the year because that gives us more access to Inuvik. It's easier for people to drive in and out and you're not waiting on weather for planes. Aklavik's Mina McLeod is involved in many community boards. She makes things happen in the Western Arctic community of just over 500. She's also manager of her family's contracting business, which creates the winter-spring vein of transport. We construct and maintain the ice road from Aklavik to Inuvik. We also maintain the runway for the airport and water delivery. However, her and her community are living with the impacts of delays in accessing that vein from climate warming. We've been doing the ice road now for about 15, more than 15 years, and uh, we've always had it open before Christmas. However, the 120-kilometer Inuvik Aklavik ice road just opened January 12th at its minimum weight capacity, monitored by the government of the Northwest Territories. So 5,000 kilograms, like my pickup, my F-150 is 3,500 kilograms. So. You can just only drive pickups and Suburbans, you know, smaller vehicles. It goes up to about 48,000 kilograms, which is when we can get the big trucks with all the building supplies, especially towards the end of the season. This is after the region accumulated more snow in December than any other year dating back to the early 80s. According to the 30 years of NWT government records, the latest the Inuvik Aklavik Ice Road opened is December 26th in 1998. The weather started off really warm and then we got a lot of snow. There was so much snow and the snow causes water on the river and it's just not safe to be plowing where there's water. We actually sunk one of our plow trucks because it was so there was so much water and it just got stuck in the overflow and it was very challenging this year. Usually by now we'd have the greater grading the roads but because we just opened it and it's still thin because it it adds ice over time it gets thicker the more you clean it but because we we opened it so late our grader hasn't been out here yet and it won't come out for a few probably another couple of weeks at least because we're only at 5,000 kilograms. We need about 14,000 or 15,000 kilograms for our grader, I believe. Usually they're starting like the first or second week of January. McLeod explains the ways the warmer weather and ice road delays have affected their community, from school closures. Because of the flat roof, all of that weight was just sitting on there. So we didn't open school for the first week after Christmas holidays until they got all of that snow off there to the continual reliance on small planes for food and mail delivery and passenger transport, but that cannot fly in poor weather. So it does create a lot of, um, a lot of hardship, especially when they're missing medical appointments, because sometimes you're waiting to see the doctor, like specialists for months, and then you finally get your appointment and then you miss it because the weather is bad. 
and your name will be entered in for a draw. I... For Young Harvester and community radio host Jesse Pascal, she feels the ongoing impacts. There's a lot of shortages that were happening throughout the last couple of weeks and just not being able to, you know, get them at the store when you want it kind of like, you know, stresses people out a little bit. A return flight from Aklavik to Inuvik um, for a 15, 20 minute plane ride, it is $400. So it's quite, uh, quite pricey and, you know, not everyone could afford could afford that like if you want to just get out for the weekend or something like just to get out of town and get your mental state back in mind it's it's hard to get out of the community the realities of climate change is not just felt in the arctic this month the european union's copernicus climate change monitoring announced that 2023 was the hottest year on record with global temperatures close to the 1.5 degree limit and where the Arctic is warming at a more significant rate. It's a tough thing to try and predict because we, we're not sure what's going to happen. Like we know that the earth, the climate is warming and it really affects our ways of life and how to um, get things done. For Pascal and community members, snowfall affects access to getting firewood and traveling by snowmobile. It was really tough for me because our family, we rely mostly on wood stove heat and I'm the one that you know goes out and gets the wood um, mostly alone and I'm really thankful with the help that I when I do get it but um, there's a lot of struggles that I've had just in the last few weeks because of the amount of snow I kept getting stuck in the snow and like five feet five feet of snow like so many times and it kind of like you know discourages me a little bit but I just keep pushing forward and just keep you just have to do what you got to do and that's what I did, just so our house could stay warm. Delay, snow levels, and a recent power plant fire scare, McLeod says community members want to see more government action. It was a little scary because a lot of people, especially the people that live in housing, they don't have wood stoves. So if they were to, if the fire kept going and if we didn't get it out right away, they would have had to bring in generators. And I don't know how they would have got them in because our ice road isn't thick enough yet and our runway isn't long enough for a big plane, like that would have been very serious if we couldn't, if they didn't get the fire out right away. We know what needs to be done, but I think the federal government and the territorial government, they have to kind of take direction from, from the local people, especially here where, you know, we don't have a full-time road. We rely on ice roads. We rely on flights most of the year, so they should make our airport longer. The Klavik Ice Road normally stays open till end of April or early May. With the amount of snow, the community is bracing for possible flooding. They're like having conversations with people that like they haven't seen this amount of snow in such a long time. So that makes us kind of concerned about um, the springtime here in Klavik. So uh, I guess we just have to, you know, wait and see and see if there's any mitigation that we'd be able to do. And the more snow you get, the more flooding you'll get in the springtime, towards the end of the season. And it's just, it's not good to get too much snow. We've already got enough for the whole year. <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, McLeod and community continue to hold events to help bring people together. Carly Schogner, APJN National News, McLavick. Great looking event there. Many, many communities, of course, feeling the effects this year. Stunning visuals also from a Klavik. The Governor General went home this month to mark a special anniversary. That story and more still to come after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And Jonathan sent us his view from his harvesting cabin located near Fort Babine in beautiful British Columbia. Ice uh, doesn't even look to be on the water there. Weather conditions look amazing. If you would like to have your photo featured as our next photo of the day, you can send your pictures to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, zero with snow for Halifax and Fredericton. Minus 20 in Kujuwak. Snow and eight below in Nain. Plus four with flurries in Montreal, cloudy and one above in Valdor. Plus two for Sault Ste. Marie, cloudy and two in North Bay. 
cloudy and three for Thunder Bay. Snow and minus two in Sioux Lookout. Minus two with snow in God's Lake. Three below with snow in Norway House. Minus four for Winnipeg. Plus two in Dauphin. Plus one in Regina. Zero for Saskatoon. Minus one in Meadow Lake, La Ronge, and Buffalo Narrows. In Northern Alberta, plus one in Fort McMurray. Minus seven with snow in high level. Six in Edmonton, five for Lethbridge. 11 above in Vancouver, 12 in Victoria. Seven in Prince George, plus two for Smithers. Minus 33 with snow in Old Crow, zero in Whitehorse. Minus 15 for Yellowknife, 23 below with snow in Norman Wells. Minus 27 in Saks Harbor, snow and 23 below in Polytech. Minus 26 with snow in Chesterfield, 18 below in Arviette. Minus 30 with snow in Resolute, 33 below in Joe Haven. Governor General Mary Simon was in her home community of Kujuac, Quebec earlier this month to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Junior Canadian Rangers. The community has a history with the Canadian military, serving as an Air Force base in the Second World War. In a speech to the Junior Rangers, Simon recalled her own father's time with the Canadian Rangers in the community during the same conflict. The Governor General also praised the regional government and institutions for helping preserve the region's Inuktitut dialect. While the main focus of the tour were the Rangers, Simon also visited local officials and health facilities. Finally here tonight, if you're looking for something to watch on Saturday night and are a big fan of the Winnipeg Jets or Toronto Maple Leafs in particular, APTN Hockey Night in Canada in Cree airs right here tomorrow night. The boys are back and ready to go. The first game of APTN's Hockey Night in Canada in Cree has the Toronto Maple Leafs visiting the Winnipeg Jets at 6 p.m. Central. The Jets are currently uh, first in the Central Division, if you can believe it, and the Leafs are currently in the middle of the Eastern Division. This is the first uh, four games we'll be covering this year. The others are Calgary visiting the Oilers on Saturday, February 24th at 9 p.m. Carolina takes on the Canadians on Saturday, March 30th at 6 p.m. And the final game has the Canadians at the Senators playing Saturday, April 13th at 6 p.m. All those are in Central Time. Can't wait to watch the game tomorrow night in Cree. It's always exciting, always great to watch the Leafs beat up on the Jets as well. I'll have on my Dougie Gilmore jersey. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, let's say, 5-1 for the Leafs. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Friday. Of course, for news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy Miigwech. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.